is a blast to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, going even further back, digging deeper, and in pursuit of the earliest instances of civilization, art, maybe even agriculture, and other various sundry things. Joining me as always are my cohorts and comrades, Jason Pendrell and James Waldo, Fellas, always a pleasure to be here with you. James Waldo, it looks like it's been a long week on your end there, sir. That or you've just been laying in the sun. Well, I've kind of been doing both of those things. I've been a lot of vitamin D lately, but I'll level with you. I, I went back to the office today for the first time. Oh! Quite, quite some time, and, I, and, and frankly, it was exhausting. Nobody honestly. wants to have to do that. No. <laughs> Normal? No. No, the not, world will never be normal again, right? Everybody wants to work from home like I do and have been doing for years, so nothing's changed for me except I've just been working a whole lot more. How's that work? Jason, how's working going for you? Well, you know, work is work. There's no need in getting on that. Uh, more importantly, though, I did get some traveling in, uh, so we uh, took a little family trip up to the Smoky Mountain uh, National Park there, uh, Tennessee, Asheville, North Carolina, on the other side of the mountains, uh, had some great uh, Japanese tapas up there in Asheville uh, with you and the family, so it was a good time. Uh, we made it back home safely, but it was good to get out, good fresh air, some hikes. Uh, the kids really love it up there, so it was an uh, excellent time. One of my favorite places to go. I just love the Smoky Mountains. Yeah, they love it here because Uncle Micah lives here, and I finally got to meet the littlest member of the Penn Trail family, which was sincerely delightful. He is just as wonderful as I thought he would be. And, uh, of course, he's he's a runner up there for Mr. Ari, uh, what, who is actually my protege, ladies and gents. You know, he, he and I have already begun Jedi training. Mm, the Force is strong with this one. <laughs> strong indeed. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he loves you. So uh, it's a, we're off to a good start on that front. He's a very inquisitive young man, and he uh, is going to make a uh, – a good addition to the team at some point. Oh, really? Absolutely. Again, you know, he reminds me so much of how I'm sure all of us were when we were kids. I was out there digging in the dirt. Although, you know, the funny thing is, I've always loved archaeology and anthropology, but I think my first love was geology, James. I was out there digging in the dirt beyond my uh, parents' property, and I was just fascinated with how you could go down and you would find layers of, like, gold and black bands you know, of, of like sandstone and different kinds of minerals and things. And you know, that just fascinated me. And I would bring back these hunks of mineral. Anytime I found quartz, you know, you'd have thunk it was gold the way I treated it. And so my mom and dad, they again, trying to cultivate these early interests, they would take me to rock and gem shows. And minerals and things fascinated me, even if they weren't rubies and emeralds and things like that. Here again, quartz. The thing about quartz that has always fascinated me is its piezoelectricity. And yes. I mean, I would I would take quartz into a dark room when I was a kid and rub them together, two hunks of quartz, and they'll light up. Yep. I mean, it's fascinating to me. Electrical potential in these stones that most people just find laying around on the ground, and they're like, eh, whatever. You know, anytime we're out there assisting on a dig site and we find a hunk of quartz, of course, we're interested because we think it might be a you know an actual artifact or at least material source for what potentially could have been an artifact. Uh, and often, indeed, when we find quartz at these sites, that's exactly what it was, even if there is no obvious artifact. We've certainly uh, pulled a lot of those out of the ground while assisting on digs with our various academic friends. And a lot of people are like, ah, not an artifact. And I'm like, look, it's quartz. <laughs> you know, I'm still fascinated <laughs> with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, is full of high adventure, man. It is. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of uh, geological specimens, uh, I got this article here, guys. I think you're going to find this really interesting because we've seen some of this before. So uh, ScienceDaily.com is reporting on this. This is coming out of University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, an article called, At Underwater Site Re Research Team Finds 9,000-Year-Old Stone Artifacts. And um, basically in the article here, they're talking about some uh, underwater archaeologists, which is something we've been talking about here a lot, have been studying 9,000-year-old stone artifacts discovered in Lake Huron that originated from an obsidian quarry more than 2,000 miles away in central Oregon. 
The obsidian flakes from the underwater archaeological site represent the oldest and farthest east confirmed specimens of western obsidian ever found in the continental United States. So that traveled a long way, and it definitely put me in mind of when we were up in Ohio looking at the uh, obsidian that was coming from the west to the Hopewell sites Yep, that they were utilizing there. That's the first thing that popped in my mind. But um, two things there, you know, the underwater archaeology, we're always talking about how important that's going to be to archaeology as we move forward. And then, again, to see something moving that far just kind of makes you rethink everything that you thought you knew 9,000 years ago, people having trade routes and moving yeah. these raw materials across. It's just fascinating. Yeah, if you could, folks, see my face. I had the wow face going on, but that's another one of those things where I keep saying, you know, a lot of our history is underwater uh, along the coast and probably in the Great Lakes. I hadn't thought of that, about that before, but I'm, that's a, another good candidate. Oh, absolutely. You know, something else that gets around our plants. Now, we don't talk about plants and botany all that much on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, but ethnobotany has always been a serious interest of mine. And, you know, recently I have been revisiting my long-held interest in ayahuasca in South America. I'll never forget the first time that I went to Lamanai in Belize. Jason, I think you've been there. And, you know, Banisteriopsis capi, the liana vine, is hanging all over the place. And this is one of the ingredients in ayahuasca. But the idea that this brew has been in use for a long time saw confirmation back in 2019. I don't think we covered this on the show, and so this isn't a new news story, but it came up recently on another show that I do. And I was just fascinated by this because it's almost in some ways similar to what you're talking about, about the movement of material stone for use in artifacts, Jason. The article by Melanie J. Miller et al., It was published in PNAS, Chemical Evidence for the Use of Multiple Psychotropic Plants in a 1,000-Year-Old Ritual Bundle from South America. This is fascinating, because not only did they find this ritual bundle, they also have a very good idea about what was in it, and these are, in fact, the exact components that we would see in modern ayahuasca ceremonies used in parts of South America. Let me just read a portion from the abstract of this. It notes this is also a documented case of a ritual bundle containing both harmine and dimethyltryptamine, the two primary ingredients of ayahuasca, the presence of multiple plants that come from disparate and distant ecological areas in South America, and this is key, this suggests that hallucinogenic plants moved across significant distances and that an intricate biological botanical knowledge was intrinsic to pre-Columbian ritual practices. Evidence of the same chemicals used in modern ayahuasca brews going back 1,000 years, but also the plants, like the stone you were talking about, Jason, they move around too. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. And when when you talk about bundle, is that like a sort of like a paleo dime bag, or is it some kind of other? <laughs> yeah, no. This this so this was a ceremonial pouch. I think it was like hogs' snouts that were sewn together, three or four of them, to create wow. a unique pouch that held these. Four uh, components. Essentially, there was harmine, which previously, of course, at one time was known as telepathine, okay, because of its apparent paranormal capabilities. This at least was the belief at the time. But we also have dimethyltryptamine, of course. This DMT is the most psychoactive component of all this. And a couple of other, well, actually, cocaine was one of the components in this particular ceremonial pouch. And then lastly, we also presumably had a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And these being the key ingredients in the modern ceremonial teas. But again, it's so fascinating to me for a few reasons. One, botanically speaking, these plants were getting around South America. Okay, in terms of the temporal relationship, this was a thousand years ago. So at least that early on, ayahuasca or the exact same chemicals were being used by shaman. But this, of course, begs the question, who in pre-Columbian America, South America, 1,000 years ago, discovered this. How did these discoveries take place? Now, that is a really intriguing anthropological question to me. And so, again, while we focus so much naturally on the material side of archaeology on this podcast, again, it's important to remember that these are materials too, but often plants and substances that are more easily broken down over time, less often easily retrieved, You know, it's very rare that you find something like this. And so a 1,000-year-old instance of these substances all in one place with the obvious apparent use, okay, of their and tapping into their psychoactive properties, this really says a lot about life ways, belief systems, and ceremonial practices in ancient South America. Yeah. You know, I I often wonder about obscure 
questions like that. How do how did they figure this out? And sometimes I think maybe it's just you know maybe you know times were hard or the, you know food was in short supply and they were just basically just trying out different things or you know like can I eat this? Can I eat that? If I eat this, I mean, how many people died eating things? You know, poisonous yeah. things like poison mushrooms. So they figured out, hey, these mushrooms are okay. And this vine over here, if we make a tea out of it interesting things happen maybe we can uh maybe we can just kind of keep, keep this around for a while yeah yeah i'm sure there was some very interesting trial and error along the way <laughs> well we know that much because of a story that we covered a few years ago where a full rattlesnake carcass was found <laughs> apparently having passed through uh, an individual and was left right at, at a former yeah. habitation site and here again this believed to have been a ceremonial practice eating a whole rattlesnake now look guys there are a lot of things i would do in the name of science and anthropology that ain't one of them that 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 had to be a dare go wrong yeah hey, cult, no, cultural norms right. guys cultural norms yeah, that's right Could have just been another day at the office for those guys could have been you never know hey listen you guys can get in on the culture of seven ages by following us online on our instagram account on twitter you can also check out videos on youtube we have all of our episodes there and of course documentaries will be dropping a new one fairly soon hopefully in the next couple of weeks in fact and, of course, all of our podcasts are available there at sevenages.org. Don't forget, of course, you can also contribute to our ongoing research in the form of a donation, which you can make right there at sevenages.org. We appreciate the ongoing support of those like Christina Frawley, our brother George, Howard, and many others who continue to support our efforts. And, of course, don't forget you can rate and review the Seven Ages Audio Journal on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting format that you like to listen to the program. Lastly, if you want to write to us, of course, we've also got all the contact information there at sevenages.org. If you would like to write to James, Jason, or I. And last but certainly not least, we should also acknowledge our brother Chase Pipes over there at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, who is a proud supporter of our podcast and our efforts. And, of course, he's always got a lot of great stuff going on. Jason, I believe during your recent travels, you also got to get over there and visit him, but he was out of town. Yeah, well, you know, Chase, he's never still for very long, and uh, summertime is always set aside for uh, father-son time with his son Isaac, and so he's a very a lucky young man who gets to go out and do some incredible things with his great dad. So they were off uh, doing their yearly summer trip, so, you know, hopefully they're having a great time and being safe out there on the road. But nonetheless, it was a uh, pleasure to stop by the Smoky Mountain Relic Room there in Sevierville, Tennessee, one of my favorite places to go. Um, first time for my two boys, so they had an absolute blast. There's no oh, way yeah. you can go there <laughs> and not have fun. Um, I don't care what age you are. It's just a wonderful place to go, and it definitely has doubled in size. So last time we talked about um, they were expanding the store. Well, they certainly have. It looks great. The new displays, uh, it's so much better to have some of the stuff spread out so that you can see it a little bit clearer. Um, store looks great. Plenty of customers in there, and it was uh, really doing some big-time business. So it was great to go by there and see it. Um, Chase, again, as usual, is always putting out material even when he's out there on the road. So, again, their educational branch, uh, Chasing History, their YouTube channel, uh, their Chasing History Radio podcast, all of those things are available and a part of what the Smoky Mountain Relic Room does there. Uh, the new uh, episodes of the podcast are going to look at the uh, – very interesting cicada phenomenon. So you guys are familiar with this. It happens uh, very rarely, I think, what, every 13 years or so? Well, Chase has provided some recipes for fried cicadas. That's right. People love to eat these things. And according to Chase, apparently they taste like shrimp. So there we are, right back to that uh, discussion we were just having. Sometimes you just got to try things. You never know what you might find. Um, also, some new podcasts from the Megalodon shark, uh, some various dinosaur fossils and how to hunt them legally and ethically. And then over on the Chasing History YouTube, we've got new episodes for uh, prehistoric mammal species, a mystery triceratops species, and uh, my, uh, Montana dinosaur hunting. So all of that can be found on the Chasing History YouTube and also the Chasing History Radio podcast. Uh, again, feel free to stop by the store there in Sevierville, Tennessee on the banks of the French Broad River, or you can always find them online at therelicroom.com. That is therelicroom.com, the largest diversity of history for sale in North America. Fantastic place. Proud sponsors of the Seven Ages Audio Journal and, of course, dear friends of the program. So, Chase, we look forward to seeing you again later this year. And, of course, on the subject of cooking cicadas, a lot of people would turn their noses up at that. You know, I've always thought it might be interesting to try various bug recipes as gross as it sounds because i mean people throughout time 
have lived off of the high-protein food source that this provides. I interviewed the Bug Chef. You know, if you've ever gone on YouTube and looked for the Bug Chef, David George Gordon, I actually spoke to him. He's a naturalist. He's not just a guy who cooks bugs. You know, David George Gordon is a guy who gets out there and he, you know, treks through the wilderness. He's very diverse in his interests. But he, of course, has kind of risen to prominence as the bug chef because he says, look, not only are bugs high in protein, they're very nutritious, but they're also delicious. And he'll go on TV and he will serve these to celebrities on television shows. It's kind of his shtick. And a lot of them are just grossed out having to eat a bug. And then there are those who are like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> these are good, just like anything else you'd eat. It's funny how there there tend to be, I think, at times, you know, cultural stigmas against the consumption of these kind of things more than it is that people are disgusted by them, let's say. So I think actually that's maybe a good idea. Go over there and check out Chase's YouTube channel and find out what you can do with all those cicadas that are flapping around outside the house. And now, look, if you're not into that kind of thing, I can assure you, you'll find plenty of other educational videos that are more in line with the kinds of things that we normally discuss on this podcast when it comes to archaeology. And Jason, of course, you and I and James, we have watched a lot of those videos over the years. I've certainly learned a lot from Chase Pipes and the fine guests that he has on his program. So check them out. And of course, as always, we have those linked in the show notes right there in your podcasting app. If you scroll down and look at the show notes for this episode, you'll find links to the Smoky Mountain Relic Room and, of course, various stories that we discuss here on the program. But one of the oldest stories when it comes to archaeologists, really, in truth, in a lot of ways, the oldest story for humankind involves an archaeological site so enigmatic and so captivating, both by its age and also what it seems to represent in terms of human development, cognitively, artistically, and otherwise. Gobekli Tepe is really unlike any other archaeological site anywhere in the world. And it is the site that really was sort of, in a lot of ways, a paradigm shift in the sense that it had to push back timescales and caused us to have to rethink what we thought we knew about human development, the rise of agriculture, you know, the time frame and also the timeline during which such innovations occurred. It was once thought, of course, that hunter-gatherers eventually gradually transition into agriculture and then the use of pottery and then, of course, megalithic structures and art follow all of that. Go back, Litepi is a unique instance of megalithic, not only structural design, but also artistic carvings in three dimensions on the surface of these stones, which were far ahead of anything that we would have expected for roughly twelve to 13,000 years ago. And yet, Gobekli Tepe represents all of these things, and thereby also represents truly, I think, an enigma in modern archaeology. And so joining us here in just a moment to discuss this is Professor Sarah Costello. Not only has she worked there, but of course she is an expert in ancient art and has worked numerous archaeological sites throughout the Mediterranean and other parts of the world exploring the questions about art and symbolism at ancient archaeological sites. We're going to be talking with Sarah Costello about Gobekli Tepe when we return right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. What a conversation we've got lined up this time around, and indeed discussing one of my personal favorite interests as far as archaeology goes, because this is one of the most enigmatic sites, truly, I think, that's ever been discovered. Sarah Costello is an associate professor of art history and director of the Humanities Program at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. She earned her Ph.D. in anthropology from the State University of New York, Binghampton, and her M.A. in classical and Near Eastern archaeology at Bryn Mawr College. Her research areas include Mesopotamia and Cypriot prehistory and museum and heritage studies. She's co-editor of several volumes that include object biographies, collaborative approaches to ancient Mediterranean art, seals and ceilings in the ancient world, and, this is an interesting one, the Routledge Companion to Ecstatic Experience in the Ancient World, which is forthcoming. Now, her work is also published in the journals of the Cambridge Archaeological Journal and Antiquity, Dr. Costello has excavated in Cyprus, Turkey, Israel, and Greece, and in 2013 participated as a Fulbright Fellow in the summer session at the American School of Classical Studies. 
In fact, this year she was awarded a university faculty fellowship in recognition of exemplary teaching, research, and service to UHCL, and so to be able to have her here joining us tonight. Dr. Costello, how are you? I am fine. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Indeed. Well, it's our pleasure, and we thank you very much for joining us tonight. And again, go back, Lee Tappy. It's a site that I think needs no introduction. Uh, arguably one of the most captivating archaeological sites anywhere in the world, not just for its age, but of course, as you're intimately aware, its art as well. What brought you, before we get into discussing the site, what brought you to that site? What about it captures your fascination? <laughs> what about it doesn't capture my fascination? I don't see how anybody could fail to be fascinated by Gebekli Tepe. Um, I had a really exciting introduction to the site actually back in the 90s. I was working at a late Neolithic site not far from there and heard about some kind of remarkable discoveries that were being made. So I was able to visit the site back then and it was in the early stages of excavation um, but it was already evident that something very exciting was happening there. So it's been on my radar for 25 years um, at this point. And then with my interests in visual culture, having a site that's so early that has such exciting visual imagery um, has always been, you know, of, of great fascination to me. Certainly. Many would consider Gobekli Tepe to have been a, I mean, a game changer, not only in terms of our understanding of the ancient world, but also certain aspects of, of the beginnings of of Neolithic stoneworking and, you know, high craftsmanship, high, you know, bas relief art. I suppose we'll get into all of that, but I'm sure Jason has some questions about this too. We'd like to probably get a general background from you about the site and its discovery, of course, the early ex excavations by Klaus Schmidt and other work that was carried out there in the early years of its discovery. Sure. Um, so as I said, in the, in the nineties, the mid nineties is when um, excavations began it had been identified as a site much earlier in the 60s when archaeological survey was being done in the region. Um, and, you know, at that time it was put on the map as a site and uh, no one got back to it. But as you probably know, there's been a lot of work along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in recent decades as they've been building dams along those rivers and... When you build a dam, a giant, a giant dam lake forms behind it, and that is a threat to um, not only the people who live in the region and their villages, which are um, uh, often destroyed, but to the archaeological heritage in the region. So archaeologists, a lot of archaeologists were brought in um, for those different projects, um, and it was as part of that, I think, that the site was revisited then in the 90s. Um, and that was uh, Harold Hauptman and then, as you said, um, Klaus Schmidt, who started working there. And Schmidt started making some really exciting discoveries, um, almost immediately finding these, these megalithic carved stones, which nobody expected from the early Neolithic. And, you know, as you're talking about that area and the building of the dams and the, the archaeological sites that are being discovered there, uh, I think oftentimes people kind of envision there in southern Turkey that Gobekli Tepe is just there by itself, but there are other Neolithic sites surrounding it. Um, could you describe some of the other sites? And are any of those sites along the same time period with Gobekli Tepe rather than it just being a solitary entity out there by itself? Right. That's a great point. Um, it's such an exceptional site that it can appear to be this sort of strange, enigmatic, solitary example of something. But um, as you say, it's really not. It's part of a long tradition of what I guess we could call the neolithization <laughs> process of um, sort of this, this change from the hunter-gatherer mobile people of the Paleolithic into the um, eventually sedentary farmers of the Neolithic, and that process went on for thousands of years, and Gubekli Tepe is part of that process. So there are other sites in the immediate region around the modern city of Shanlurfa that 
have evidence of T-shaped pillars like the ones um, at Gebekli Tepe. Nothing as as intact or grand or exciting, but these sites tell us that Gebekli was certainly not alone in its immediate locality. And then if you go beyond the immediate locality and you move south down the Euphrates, across the modern border into Syria, we find sites that show um, certain similarities, in some case strong similarities, to Gebekli Tepe um, that date to the same time period. And basically, if you go in any direction from Gebekli Tepe, you will find um, sites that you can say in one way or another relate to Gebekli Tepe, either through... um, skull treatment or having a special building of some kind or having imagery that's related. So they're not carbon copies of Gebekli, but you can sort of find these threads of connection. Now, one of those uh, sites nearby, Bonkuklu Tarla, fascinates me because, again, this is a site that's right around the same age, and it also seems to have one of the earliest functional sewer systems. Uh, of of an archaeological site, if my understanding is correct. And that's it, it's just stunning when you come across that kind of technological innovation. And it to me, it's always a reminder that those people were us. They had our brains. They had our capabilities. And, you know, there's, um, there's now evidence at Gebekli Tepe of fairly elaborate water systems there, too. So to find that at the site that, that you mentioned is um, quite in keeping. Yeah. So when we talk about the Neolithic period in relation to Gobekli Tepe, how many years before present is that? What's that age of the site? Yeah, it's about um, 13,000 BP. So we're talking about like a 1,500-year period um, from about say, 11,000 to 9,500 B.C. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a, I mean, not only is that a long time ago from now, but it was a pretty broad period of time just for the, you know, for the, I guess, the occupation of the site. And would that be the oldest known uh, megalithic site like that, that that we know of? Yeah, it is um, the oldest known megalithic site. And Okay. It just nobody expected anything like that. There were, there was at the time nothing quite like it known. I mentioned those sites in Syria, and they do not have the megaliths that compare to Gebekli Tepe. It really stands alone wow. in having those enormous structures. Yeah. Yeah, and when you look at the site and the surrounding area, you can't help but imagine, you know, there because there's so many areas and, and that it, that particular region that still are haven't been fully excavated. It's in fact Gobekli Tepe itself hasn't been completed as far as the excavation goes. Um, it is possible that we find another site that could potentially even be to some degree older than Gobekli Tepe. But as of now, it's standing sort of in solitude has that shining example for that time period. Um, the location of it, where it's positioned kind of high up near the Tigris and Euphrates river uh, do you, the archaeologists there at the site give any particular um, account to where it's positioned, you know, being high up like that, sort of overlooking that surrounding area? Um, mm-hmm. Is there any degree of importance to why it was placed there as far as the position of the actual site itself? I think that um, the position, I think you're right to note the position. What it has is visibility and you know, it's it it's often referred to as a, as as a gathering point. You know, and Schmidt had really thought of the people who used Gebekli Tepe as being um, still a hundred percent mobile, and then they would gather at Gebekli Tepe and do something in these buildings, and then go on their sort of mobile um, foraging ways. And now it's evident that there were um, at least partially sedentary people who were living at the site, right? There are some um, some domestic structures there. So for at least part of the year, for at least some years, we don't know the pattern of, of mobility or sedentism exactly, but that people were living there. But even so, if you think about um, 
it still potentially is being a place that people might come and gather because as far as we can tell, there wasn't anything else quite like it. So I would leave that possibility open that people may, even people who didn't live there may have come there. Visibility, I think, is is really important. It, it actually, if I can digress for a minute, it reminds me of this really wonderful site that I've been working at on Cyprus um, for the last decade or so called Prastio Mesorotsos, which is directed by Andrew McCarthy and, and Lisa Graham. And we found there an early Neolithic feasting pit, a pit for cooking into, you know, at a large scale that would only be used for feasting. And the way that this pit is, is situated and that therefore the fires for the pit must have been and the feast itself must have been situated had visibility in sort of three different directions across the landscape because of the situation of the hills and the rivers and so on. So that kind of thing comes to mind when I think about Gebekli Tepe too, because um, it is sort of uh, on this, it's on this high, uh, the highest part of a very low, what's called a mountain range, but they're really more like rolling hills. And it's kind of on the highest of these hills. And as you look to the south from Gebekli Tepe, you see straight across this broad Haran plain, um, very, very flat, and on a clear day, you can see really far in that direction. And as you look in the other directions, you see the hills in the distance, so that from any direction, people would see, you know, are the fires lit, <laughs> right. so to speak, right? And if you were on that hill, of course, you would see off into the into the distance too. And I do think that that's important as a um, as a, an attractor, as a you know point of communication and gathering and you know yeah certainly and then looking at the site so we've kind of got a a general idea of the region we kind of can envision where it's positioned kind of up on that hill Uh, but the layout of the site itself we know it's made of many concentric rings of these t-shaped pillars uh, some of them in high relief with the carvings uh, very unique and very beautiful amongst the the uh, ancient assemblages we don't really see anything else quite like it as far as the the shape and the outlay of the site. So both the excavated and unexcavated portions um, give a general description for someone who may not be completely familiar with the site. How is this laid out and sort of what is the interpretation of why it may be the way that it is as far as the shape? Sure. So, um, you know, picture uh, then this natural hill on which we have, 15 meters of cultural deposits creating a kind of, um, you you know, artificial hill on top of that with almost sort of two bumps on the top, but that's all occupational. So that wouldn't have have been there, of course, as they're building. So on this hilltop, it's a, this is, um, this is a limestone terrace, really. And they, built these special buildings. Now, eight of these special buildings or community buildings, I like the term community buildings, have been excavated. And they're spread out on this hilltop, but they kind of cluster along this stepped limestone slope so that they were using the existing steps, evidently, and this is how it's described by the current project coordinator, um, Dr. Lee Clare, who's done the most uh, the most recent work on the site. And he describes that the people use these limestone terraces and dug them out down to the bedrock to create semi-subterranean structures, and the terraces themselves made more of you know, part of the building a little more exposed than others, right, if you can imagine, so that on one side these buildings may have looked out down the plain. Um, So you have these eight excavated large round buildings that are semi-subterranean, and then there's more of them that haven't been excavated, and the ground-penetrating radar um, definitely shows that there's more structures underground. The archaeologists don't 
agree entirely on on how many or how to interpret that data yet, but there's clearly more that's underground. Um, so around these large community buildings then, what they have found just recently in the last few years is that there were smaller, what we can think of as residential buildings that seem to be, as far as I can tell from looking at the excavation plans, almost in, in a sort of arc around those special buildings. Yeah, and that's very interesting because previously the presence of uh, domestic establishments had sort of been uh, look, overlooked or disregarded, saying that this was sheerly a ritual space and that those domestic areas were not there. But now that uh, certainly seems to be the case that they were indeed to some degree uh, in the area around Gobekli Tepe, which I think is very interesting to the, the story as it begins to grow. But as we look more at the what we call or what Klaus Schmidt was referring to as the first temples, that's where your work really begins to shine because we're able to, we've talked about the archaeology before. I think everybody's uh, pretty familiar with the layout of the site. If not, you can certainly go online and look at it. But your area of expertise where you're looking at it in a different way is what I find really fascinating is one of the major reasons we wanted to have you on the show tonight. So let's look at a little bit of your work as far as the symbology and exploration of sensory experiences at Gobekli Tepe. So uh, starting there, just give us some background on your interpretation of some of the symbology and how, kind of how you're looking at it through your viewpoint. Okay, sure. Um, so, I, you know, I think what people probably know is that y you have these big carved stone pillars that were built into the building. So you have a wall, an exterior wall, um, and within that wall, kind of partially built into that wall, were pillars that were carved with a lot of images of animals, birds, foxes, snakes, scorpions, cattle, boar, etc., right? A real range of, of animals. And then in the center of the structures were two really large T-shaped pillars. These are five meters tall and the pillars themselves and this is really interesting are anthropomorphic so they're abstract they're t-shaped but if you were looking at them from sort of the side of the t you would be looking at a person so that the top of the t is the head and that's evident because there are arms and hands carved on the side of the pillar that come around to the front. And it's wearing clothes. It's wearing a carved loincloth and, um, and a necklace, you know, these. So they're really clearly human formed. So what really struck me is <laughs> not just me, other people who are looking at these things is what on earth are these, you know, 15 foot high human representations right are they gods they feel like they must be gods because what what on earth could they be if you start saying what are they right are they really really tall people are they gods it just it, it, it's hard to explain um and that's that's it's actually a really controversial question because there aren't anthropomorphic gods attested until I'm trying to think of the earliest, it's really clear, it would be the third millennium BC. And, you know, we're back in the 11th. So you don't know you have something until you have it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that they can't be gods. They can't be representations of, of anthropomorphic gods. But it would be surprising in a hunter-gatherer culture at that time, given what we know um, about comparable cultures and about the time period and about the rest of the Neolithic, it would be surprising. We imagine more of a kind of animistic belief system, right? Animistic meaning nature is kind of animated as, as, as deities. So instead, I look at these anthropomorphic figures as representing a kind of enhanced and amplified 
human presence and human power, almost like, I could think of it almost like potential, right? And that they're wanting to tap into that potential and that power and maybe it's a spiritual power maybe it's simply human presence like I don't want to overinterpret this but I would see it as human and that then you start to imagine these spaces as spaces where a community could gather what motivated them was it fear was it joy who knows like I, I'm I'm not going to go into that level of interpretation but they gathered with the aim of amplifying that sort of human potential and human power and and i think of it as a kind of spiritual experience that they had so to come back to your question the it's the scale that really strikes me so you have the enormous pillars that are anthropomorphic but then in contrast we have throughout the site the use of miniatures so some of the same imagery carved on these small stones and miniature versions of masks made of stone that correspond to larger stone masks that were found and miniature versions of these porthole stones that look like the larger ones and I think that they're playing with sensory contrasts as a way to kind of amplify the experience that people are having in these spaces. Yeah, you know, maybe to amplify that point, uh, drawing from some of your own work in writing, uh, you emphasize the role of size in a lot of these, not just at Gobekli Tepe, but also at other sites. You know, an example you give is the stag hunt painting at Chateau Hoyuk, I believe, and how there's a much oversized stag compared to the hunters around it. One interpretation, and again, this is purely interpretive on our part, this is mere speculation, but I mean, the largeness of the anthropomorphic shapes might be to cast humans as being large and, and, and dominant in a natural framework in which normally animals often did have the upper hand until we began wielding spears and stone tools and what have you. So, I mean, that could be one interpretive element of this, which really kind of speaks to the essence of a lot of your own writing about the site. Would you like to comment on that aspect? Yeah, I really like the way you put that. And, you know, if you think about what's happening in the Neolithic in general, the when we talk about the Neolithic, we usually are talking about the Neolithic period, but the Neolithic is really a process, right? It's a, it's a process through which people started to control their resources and produce food. So in essence, our role in the natural world sort of shifts, right, from being kind of part of that world and gathering things from it to controlling it in a certain way. And therefore, the, that enhanced, enlarged role of the human, you know, maybe is, is in some way expressive of the desire to wield that power. I'm I'm really going going a little a little far here in my interpretations, but I think it's I think it's important to do that. I think you know we have to be responsible scientists and we have to stay grounded in the data, but I also think we have to float these interpretive ideas and try to find a little bit of meaning. Because otherwise, you know, what's the point of what we're doing? Well, when we go to art museums, we do that, don't we? Of course, yeah. Right. And again, there's an awful lot of a lot of art at Gobekli Tepe. You know, it's a different thing, of course, to interpret the archaeology, but come on, there's art there. And I don't know what was in the mind or the hearts of those artisans, but, you know, it certainly strikes chords in us as modern humans, essentially no different from them, but going and looking at it. And again, part of the wonder to me is trying to figure out what these things meant. Uh, you know, before we move away from the art, though, and we're discussing some of the, you know, the animal forms that are represented, we have foxes. We have, of course, the famous vulture stone or vulture pillar. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that particular imagery and perhaps the role of the vulture in the the belief systems of the people of this time period. Could we talk a little about that and what that could and maybe what other animal representations on the adjacent pillars also may represent? Yeah, I um, I would love to, you know, I would love for my next book to be <laughs> a full interpretation of all the animals and represented at Gebekli Tepe. It won't be because I really don't know how to do that. But I do have thoughts on the vultures and on the snakes and some of the other animals, 
you know, because I've given a lot of thought to the vultures, as you say, are this recurring motif throughout the Neolithic and into the historical periods as well in Mesopotamia. And that meaning shifts, of course, over time. We're talking about thousands of years. But vultures are these really interesting animals in that they are feeding off the dead, right? So they're alive because they're consuming dead things and they kind of represent a cycle therefore sort of cycle of life right and snakes in the same way can do that because snakes shed their skin so they sort of can represent rebirth and at the same time you have vultures in the air and you have snakes that sort of slither underground so you're getting this evocation of like a tiered cosmos right this kind of sky earth um, underground sense. So seeing those animals repeat over time has made me think that is a meaningful correlation to draw. I'm not going to look at one image of a vulture and start making all kinds of wild speculation. But when you see it again and again, and in places like Chatel Huyuk, where you have you know, representations of headless humans and you have the skull treatment and you have the vultures shown with the headless humans, it, it, it doesn't start to sound so crazy to think that the vultures are related to these ideas about, about life and death. Yeah, and as we look at this time period again, it's again like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Costello, earlier, there is that blending, if you will. You have... Uh, social and economic world sort of beginning to merge. Um, you're kind of seeing still a hunter gatherers sort of mentality, but obviously with the Gobekli Tepe being developed in the way that it is, they're being drawn into a centralized location. And so then when we look at things um, returning to the discussion of the miniatures, because I think that's a really key point here, um, you have that megalithic building you have the stone benches that are aligned within the structures. So you have things that are very um, indicative of what we would consider to be a ritual space, but yet the miniatures is almost like something that you could take with you in a way. If you were going back out to the journey of hunting for the animals and being in the wild and, and maybe in an annual cycle or whatever they did return back to go back to Tepe, it's, almost seems like something uh, of ritual significance that you could take with you. What are your thoughts on the miniatures themselves and what the value may have been to the people at Gobekli Tepe as far as that type of artifact is concerned? Yeah, these these little stones, they're sometimes called plaquettes. They're sometimes called shaft straighteners because they sometimes have a long groove on the back like you would use to straighten an arrow shaft. Um, so they're referred to in different ways in, in you know, different site reports, but um, they're often carved with these, with these same images, and they're small. You could hold them in your hand. And I, I see them as being part of the beginning of this really long tradition of carving <laughs> images onto small pieces of stone, which develops into the stamp seals and eventually cylinder seals in the region, which are... Um, such widespread artifacts and they are portable and they are personal and maybe they had amuletic functions you know who knows maybe they were I tend to refer to them in this very generic way and call them memory tools or you could think of it as like information storage in the because you take an idea that might be in your head or expressed to you and you put it in an object by writing it down with a symbol or later with writing, right? And then that idea is now in something that's outside of your head. And by, by making that external, you can give it to someone and you transfer that idea. You can leave it behind and the idea remains in time even if you're not there so there's all different ways that kind of symbolic storage works from a communication perspective and a memory perspective um, and if you think about a place as evidently powerful as Gobekli Tepe to be able to do as you said Jason and and take a little piece of that away 
either away from the experience to your house that's 20 feet away or away to a totally different site. And we do find these similar stones at sites, you know, down in Syria and, um, you know, in northern Iraq. So they they do seem to have have feet, so to speak. Another symbolic representation that appears at Gobekli Tepe as well is, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with the uh, design I'm talking about, these sort of H-shaped symbols. Now, of course, it's very uh, easy for us to look at that and recognize this as a you know modern, you know stylistic, uh, you know stylistic or a you know or a lettering kind of you know representation of language. Probably wasn't that to the builders of Gobekli Tepe, but do we have any kind of indication or idea about what that might be, uh, what it might represent? I don't. Um, I haven't. I haven't really devoted enough thought to that image to really have come up with any kind of a theory. Um, I think it is interesting to think about the more abstract symbols, though, like like that one and what they might mean. You know, if you look back to Paleolithic image making, cave art, right, there have been a lot of really interesting um, articles written suggesting that there is communication potential in that art, you know, and not only in the, you know, both in the, in the, in the representational art and the image of images of the animals, but also in the abstract symbols. It's not anything we'll ever decode, but that, and I wouldn't call it writing, of course, because I think, you know, writing is a structured system that you, know, you have to kind of tick certain boxes before you're in a writing system, but still as a way of communicating through abstract symbols if they could do it in the Paleolithic, why not in, you know, the early Neolithic? Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes we just have to resign ourselves to the fact that there's, especially with symbology and interpretation, um, much of that's going to be subjective to who's looking at it. And simply put, we're not going to be able to figure everything out unless there is a Rosetta Stone type of discovery where you can literally translate it. But as we begin to try to understand not only the structures and the symbology that's present there on the stone at Gobekli Tepe, now that we have new information about the domestic surrounding uh, the temple areas, uh, if you want to call them that, we're also seeing other indications of some of the ritual activity that was taking place there. Specifically, I want to talk about the interpretation of um, the skulls and um, some of the burial remains that have been found. Uh, that. I remember a couple of years ago, there were some articles coming out about the very specific type of skull treatment. Some people calling it a skull cult or a ritual um, area for that sort of interpretation. So what are your thoughts on the actual human interactions we see with the site as far as uh, human remains, the skulls, and the other burials that have been found at the area? Sure. They haven't found a lot, um, to my knowledge, but they have found some. Some burials below floors and some skulls that show evidence of um, some kind of treatment. There's scratches, there's marks on the skulls, right? So they weren't just buried, but they were, you know, buried probably and then disinterred and maybe a skull removed, cleaned, um, you know, and I'm saying this based on evidence from other Neolithic sites. There are a lot of Neolithic sites in the region and, you know, to the west and to the south that show what we call some kind of a skull cult, some kind of skull treatments, right? And what they do is they bring the skull back and they and they live with it in some way, right? So you could cover it with plaster to kind of revivify it, um, decorate it with cowrie stones, cowrie shells or, or stones in the eyes to make it kind of come to life or just place it out somewhere visible in, in the space that you live. And, um, you know, to us that seems so weird, but it's, it's not that weird, right? You know, the, what they're doing when they bury people below the floor of a house is they're literally putting down roots, Right. And they're saying, this is us. Like this space is where our family is and our ancestors are actually here, you know, in this space. Right. 
you know, where we sleep, where we put our head down on the floor to sleep, where <laughs> we're resting our head only feet from where that skull is buried. So they're keeping their their loved ones, their ancestors close. And then sometimes they seem to want them closer and they take them out of the ground and they bring them back into the house. Um, so that family history must be important and that's not so surprising. It's important to us today in establishing links with, with that place, with that home and that house as a representation of the family seems to be important too. So it really was a matter of time before this evidence would come up at Gebekli Tepe. I don't think anybody was surprised because it is so widespread. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, really, as you're describing those cultural practices, it's, it's not that unusual. Um, they may think, you know, if they were able to see what we do with our burial practices that putting someone in a box in the ground in their Sunday's best is unusual or strange. Um, so really, you know, the, those type of practices have been, you know, found repeatedly throughout history and in a way it makes sense um, when you look at it through that viewpoint. But as we begin to look at the site a little bit more in depth, I can't help but wonder um, sort of this springing up, if you will, of a ritual type site of, a site of great importance. Is there any indication, speculation, thoughts in general on what led to the establishment of something like a Gobekli Tepe? Um, It certainly just didn't come out of anywhere, but is there any indication as to what would have motivated people to begin to build these type of structures so long ago in history? Yeah, you know, (laughs) um, I think it's viewed so differently by different scholars. It's almost like a chicken and an egg argument, right? Did people start doing intense kind of symbolic things only after they were gathered in, in one place as a community and they needed a social glue to make it work? <laughs> so ritual started as kind of an answer to that. Or was it ritual that attracted people to a place, you know, and I find that to be a little bit more, to me, a more sensible answer, that places were viewed as powerful. I mean, you know, you think of a place like Delphi in Greece, right, the navel of the, of, of the earth, it, the idea that certain places are meaningful and powerful um, because they offer a connection to a spirit world, or maybe it's because it's the place you bury your dead and so you come back to it. But I think places were attractors and, you know, you're all familiar with the changing climate and the end of the Paleolithic and some of the big changes that happened that may have disrupted some of the patterns of subsistence that had been successful in the past. And to me, that's always, that's always the part that really just gets me wondering, you know, you do something one way for hundreds of thousands of years and then <laughs> you change. Why do you do it? Why do you settle down? Why do you start producing your own food? Like what, and I guess that's what you're asking me. What is the motivation f- for a change to suddenly stay at Gobekli Tepe to start building big things? And I do think you have to look to a a belief, a belief in some kind of spiritual thing, and whether that's the the people, the place, some event, I feel like it has to, it it can't just be economic, in other words. Right. You know, it it would be interesting to break some of this down. Uh, As you mentioned earlier about Klaus Schmidt and his early work there, uh, he seemed to think that there was this ritualistic site And I'll, of course, point out that he referred to it as a temple. I believe the current site director uses a different terminology. Is that right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, but now Klaus, of course, still thought that people were ranging around and that they were hunter-gatherers. I wonder, I've often wondered, in fact, if that hadn't been influenced somewhat by, again, the traditional thinking up until that time, but more and more evidence seems to indicate that you know, sites like Gobekli Tepe and nearby sites, some of which we've discussed over the course of the conversation— there did seem to be permanent or semi-permanent habitation that occurred there. We also must recognize that, I mean, a very short distance from Gobekli Tepe, we also have essentially the beginnings of what many recognize as uh, agriculture. 
Uh, and so, you know, there may have been environmental climate changes, you know, any number of things that were happening around this time that influenced these factors. But to me, it almost seems like in various parts of the world, given certain conditions, you know, climatologically, you know, geographically and otherwise, different things may have happened for different people. I mean, we still have hunter gatherers in parts of the world today. And so, you know, maybe it's not so mysterious that Gobekli Tepe was functionally something that seemed almost anachronistic for its time, but at that time in that place with those people and whatever they believed, it seemed to work incredibly well, despite being pre-pottery, pre-agriculture, right? You know, it's, right, and maybe right. it's not so anachronistic altogether, but what yeah. are your thoughts on that? And I think you're right. I think it's not anachronistic. I think, you know, if if you kind of look look at this over over a from a wider lens, what you see is an environment that had become more hospitable, allowing people to stay in one place for longer, maybe not all year, every year, but for longer periods of time, right? Um, so you think, uh, yeah, I know you all looked into um, Abu Huraira, right? So Abu Huraira, they could stay in one place. They're hunter-gatherers, but they had enough resources nearby to allow that to happen. Um, so there may have been certain places where for one reason or another, people would stop moving. And I always do this little kind of exercise with my students when we talk about this. You know, we think of, <laughs> we're all sedentary people for the most part, right? And we have all this stuff and we like to be in one place. So we kind of come at this from a sedentary perspective. And we think, well, of course, as soon as people could settle down, they did. But there were a lot of reasons not to, and they would have had to have had a good reason to settle down. Because if you stay in one place, people know where you are, predators know where you are, disease begins to, you know, spread potentially, you have social challenges, you can't just go your separate ways if you start fighting, you're living next door to each other. So there are a lot of challenges to staying in one place. And so you would need a good reason to, but evidently in some of these scattered communities at the end of the Paleolithic and the beginning of the Neolithic, they had enough reasons to start to put down roots. And it kind of feels like it was a bit of a one-way street. Once you start that process, it's, it's, a, it's not impossible to go back to a more nomadic existence, but it's challenging, right? You lose some of that knowledge of the roots and the resources in other places, and um, you have come to rely on local resources. So there may have been, in essence, some kind of inevitability once that process started. Certainly. Yeah. Those are very good points. And, you know, it, it really gets me thinking in a whole bunch of different directions. Um, kind of hinted at it a few minutes ago, but it seems like, again, you know, what would be the appeal for people who are living in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, like you said, to come in to an area like this, whether it's annually, permanently, whatever it is, um, it almost seems like there has to be some sort of cultural trauma or some sort of widespread belief that, that brings the people together because um, when you're a hunter gatherer and you're beginning to start living in a solitary environment like that, it, like you said, you described it perfectly. It doesn't make sense, but that type of lifestyle within one or two generations could become the norm because then that's all that those people know. So when we look at the site, as far as its um, existence as a time period, um, through the stratigraphic layers that have been dated and everything that's indicative of the site, how long does it look like the site was actually used and occupied uh, as a cultural center? It looks like its use spans about 1,500 years from the, from the, the pre-pottery Neolithic A into the pre-pottery Neolithic B, so the two sort of early phases of the Neolithic. And as we look at, again, the structure, Klaus Schmidt referred to the structures as enclosures. Um, he thought that they were possibly left open as like an open air assemblage. Um, others think that they may have been covered. And as we see sometimes with cave art, um, there's a lot of studies recently that I've been reading that 
the way that you look at the art, and again, I want you know your thoughts on this because this is you, you really delve into the sensory experiences. So this cave art a lot of times is meant to be looked at through the flickering of firelight um, and interpreted in certain ways because of the lighting, because of the mood, because of the ambiance. What do we know or what do we think about Gobekli Tepe, whether it would make a big difference, whether it was an open air assemblage, whether it was covered and how the people may have interpreted the carvings or the rituals that were going on inside. What are your thoughts on those two perspectives of the site? Yeah, well, I, I do think that they were most likely covered. They were roofed. That seems to be um, the explanation that's, that's best supported by the evidence and the structures and how you would keep the pillars standing, you know, you would sort of need, um, need the counter balance of the, the roof. So I think that they were, that they were roofed, you know, and, and Schmidt was beginning this process and, and he really, I think had a, um, a really beautiful way of seeing the site and of thinking about it and was able to really think big. And now, of course, as, as happens in science and with new discoveries, they are shifting perspective. So, for example, we're all talking about these as ritual spaces, but we're also not really comfortable with that term temple. And there, there's a good reason for that, right? When you think of a temple, you think of a community that gathers together to worship the god, that's usually an anthropomorphic god, that kind of owns that space in a sense, right? The temple is the god's house. And that's not that's not how we're seeing these things. So we don't want to bring that kind of more modern baggage to the site. So to think of them as ritual buildings or special buildings or just use terms that don't evoke um, don't evoke other practices helps. Um now, to your question about how things were experienced within those spaces, if they were roofed, I think that you're right that it's important to think about what that sensory experience would have been. Now, I've only been to this part of Turkey in the summer. It's really hot. The sun is really strong, and I know it must be different in the, in the winter and in the spring, and I would love to have that experience at some point. But, you know, in my experience, it's a, it's a punishingly bright and hot place. And to think about going from that bright sunlight and heat into a very dark semi-subterranean space would have been a very powerful contrast. So you're in a dark space and then you have that visual adjustment you have to make. Can, you know, what can I see here in the dark? And there's flickering lights. There's some kind of lamps or torches. And then you suddenly have these images surrounding you and big pillars and human forms that aren't exactly human but kind of human. And I think that would have all been part of the reception of that imagery, almost creating, you know, I, I think I put it in my article as sort of almost like virtual reality, right, where you're in a very different um, space, yeah, a quote from your article, if I may share it. This, these structures and carvings were constructed in a world in which altered landscapes and permanent structures were new expressions of human thought and will. And that they certainly were. Now, James, by the way, had a question, I believe, about the stone itself. Well, I actually had a, sorry, I had a couple of questions, and I just thought of something when you were talking about that. Is you know, it's, most people don't really experience long periods of time out of doors, out of buildings, and that type of thing. I have, unfortunately. Uh, and when you do go back into structures, it's a really kind of an unusual experience. It can be kind of a confining thing. So I actually could see how that, that you know, that experience of going into these ritual structures or, or however they were constructed could be, you know, could be kind of a uh, kind of a mind altering or a life altering experience for some folks. But my question was, I had two actually. One was, what are the stone pillars themselves constructed out of? Is that the, you know, the the native rock, the limestone or what's nearby. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the, um, the other question was when we talked earlier about the anthropomorphic, the larger pillars, and we were talking about the meanings and, you know, possible interpretations of those. I got to thinking as we understand uh, humans, you know, in a lot of ways we haven't changed very much over long periods of time. Could those possibly be uh, celebrations of, for lack of a better word, celebrity 
or possibly <laughs> monuments to one man or woman's vanity. Uh, I think that's a really neat idea. And I was just reading something from one of the excavators. I'm sorry, I don't remember which um, which person it was or which article, but they were saying that you get the sense that those pillars were someone they knew because of the way they're dressed, right? And that does start to make you think, yeah, could these have been individuals? Like this was a real hotshot or a powerful leader or a powerful shaman or something like that that is being celebrated in this way. And I guess it could have been. I mean, you know, like you said, how different from us would they have been? Egos. <laughs> yeah, and we certainly see that, uh, you know, comparatively uh, short, shortly after that uh, in terms of distance from Go back to Egypt and Egypt and ancient Egypt to, to now. Uh, we certainly saw that, of course, in the dynastic period in Egypt. And so, uh, you know, again, it seems that we have, I think, a kind of timeline where we can look back through history and we can see that very same sort of thing occurring. So it seems to make sense, doesn't it? What about celestial alignments? I know that's probably a bit outside the scope of you know the artistic and symbolic representations at Gobekli Tepe, but I'm interested in the archaeoastronomical aspect as it relates to so many of these sites. Gobekli Tepe seems to have some apparent alignment as well, does it not? Well, I know that the team is working with archaeoastronomists and they're definitely looking into that. So I'm pretty eager to see what they determine. Um, I've always thought, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of the stars to ancient people. And, you know, James, you were just saying people don't spend a lot of time outside, and it's a shame. And when we do, and we get to see, you know, I get to go out to West Texas every now and then and, and see the stars out at Big Bend, and it's just like a... I always think... This is how people in ancient times saw the sky. And how could you ignore it when it's that bright and that powerful? Um, so, yeah, if you're looking at that every single night up in the sky, it's, it's got to be part of, part of what you're thinking about and maybe what you're representing. But beyond that, I can't say I'm not an archaeoastronomer. Right. I think we'll probably have to wait and see additional information forthcoming. Jason? Yeah, well, you know, uh, nearly every, you know, organized religion has its roots in the stars, really, if you want to get down to it. Um, the stars have always been the stars, the tracking of planets, the sun, the moon, all of those things have always been vitally important because it's only been the last, you know, few years in human history that we've been living the, the, way, the way we are today. So, you know, living outside, observing nature, observing the stars and the movements would only make sense, especially looking back at a... Uh, time that's so long ago um you know it certainly wouldn't surprise me to see those those um alignments uh, come to fruition there at the site but as we begin to um kind of get toward the end of the the conversation here i want to make sure that um we've covered everything that we can cover as far as uh interpretation um, of the site for what it's 1500 year as you described length uh, it was obviously a very important place for a very long time to a uh, group of people. Is there any indication, I, I know this is hard to to come by because there's not burials and there's not a lot of domestic um, area there to, to examine, but do we have any idea of the amount of people that the site could have contained, um, that it could have utilized inside of that space, and then uh, regionally, um, is there any indication of what the population may have been at that time? Yeah, I don't know those numbers. One thing I have heard um, Dr. Lee Clare talk about is the Dunbar number, which is a concept I've always been really fascinated by. I don't know if you guys have talked about that on here at all, but that number of 150, which is sort of the group, the, it's the group size that our brains can deal with where we know the other people. And he does see... Good Beckley, I think, is having crossed over that tipping point to beyond 150, and that that would have been part of what would have required some more social, you know, community building type activities. Um, so that's the only number I can I can really give you in terms of 
of the population. I'm afraid I don't know better than that. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's, it's a thought experiment. You know, again, um, we always wonder, you know, we do a lot of information and research on the Clovis, and we're always asking, what was the number? How many people are we talking about? You know, uh, what were family units? How big were they? Um, those type of things. Uh, one thing I do want to get um, out, make sure that we, we do cover is, uh, aside from necessarily interpreting the site and trying to make sense of it, having been there yourself, uh, something that we haven't had the pleasure to do to this point, um, outside of everything we've discussed, what are your thoughts and feelings? Uh, what do you feel when you're actually at the site? Uh, what type of impression did it make on you the first time that you've seen it? It has a very lonely, well, it used to. I think it's changed so much because they have a huge visitor center. And I, I don't think anybody feels lonely there anymore. But that was the feeling I got was it felt a little desolate, felt a little lonely, a little exposed. Um, you know, the landscape has changed a lot, of course, over time and been denuded through human use. So it's hard to picture it being a greener place potentially um, as it as it may have been back then, but it does feel, especially in the heat of the summer, a little bit lonely. I, and it, it, and it's not, you know, once you get outside of, of the city of San Leorfa, it, it it's fairly sparsely populated. And that, I think, can help you sort of imagine, a, in a way, a Neolithic landscape. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, I can't help but think about the fact that this site was buried. I mean, archaeology, of course, usually involves... Uh, sedimentary layers that build up over ancient human occupations over time. But, I mean, Gobekli Tepe is a, a bit different in the sense that we find evidence of intentional burying there. So, you know, what was the intention as the site was being closed down in the past? Was this preservation? Was this ritual? Will we ever know? Yeah, and I think that seems to be one of the things that they're reinvestigating now. Um, and they think, you know, the that maybe the buildings weren't intentionally buried and closed, but rather filled in gradually over time um, with sedimentation. So I think we have to, we have to still wait and see what future work is going to show us about that. Yeah. Klaus Schmidt once said, go back Tepe doesn't so much rewrite history. It merely expands it. How in your mind, as we close things out, does go back Tepe expand our knowledge of the ancient past? Oh, for me as an art historian, it expands our concept of human beings as, you know, as artists, as creators of images. If you look at the textbook we used to use for Mesopotamian art, no one made art before <laughs> the fourth millennium BC, and even that stuff wasn't really worth talking about. So to have pushed it back this far, I think, just is a much more expansive and interesting way of seeing our human ancestors. Indeed. Well, Dr. Costello, it has certainly been a joy to speak with you, and you have been a certain pleasure. Uh, we hope that we can speak with you again sometime and that your work will continue, whether it go back to Tappy or at any of the other many sites that you work at, and, of course, that you will grace our presence yet again sometime on down the road here at the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. Likewise. Special thanks again to Sarah Costello, Ph.D., for being our esteemed guest on this edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal and discussing truly an archaeological site that I think not only was a game changer for archaeologists who had been in this field for decades, but of course for people like us who are avocationalists and who are, again, speaking for myself, I'm fairly new to all of this within the last maybe five to ten years. But learning about Gobekli Tepe changed my perspective and really kind of drew me in to archaeology. You could think of it very much like a sort of gateway drug. I think a lot of people hear about a site so old, 
and one which challenges so many of our existing notions about human development over time and archaeological discoveries, Gobekli Tepe, older than most. And yet, of course, it represents art and architecture and things which we wouldn't have expected for pre-pottery Neolithic Anatolia, Turkey. And so, again, it remains maybe not entirely an anomaly like we discussed with Costello there. Uh, maybe it's not all that strange. It's unique, of course, in the broad scope of archaeology, but for its time and how it was built and for the people who built it, you know, this may have been a natural progression, which really, again, I think is an opportunity. If we look at it like that, this represents an opportunity for us to rethink how human development occurs and how it can do so on a case-for-case -case basis among geographically constrained individuals, you know, cultural groups, what have you. I think that there's a lot of potential in terms of the ongoing studies at Gobekli Tepe, but I hope that those studies will continue. Really, I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to ask questions about the ancient past and to learn from sites like Gobekli Tepe, considering how much more they no doubt have to offer us. But I'll always have to point out, as I so often do, there wasn't a Gobekli Tepe until there was a Gobekli Tepe. And I wonder, are there going to be other sites? When are we going to find one that's 20,000 years old that seems to represent similar kind of manifestations of, again, what we would not recognize for several more thousands of years and after the institution of agriculture, pottery, and similar things? I wonder how much further these kinds of discoveries might go back. We may still have a few surprises out there awaiting us in the archaeological record, only if we'll dig deeper, my friends. So, like I said, you know, those answers are off the coast somewhere. Pick a coast. Those 50,000-year-old sites, 100,000-year-old sites, they're out there. Um, but they're just waiting, really, they're waiting for the next glacial maximum. I wonder if we'd have representations of architecture and art. I mean, I bet you that there's art out Why there, not? but I mean, but what, what about structures? I wonder if there will be structures that are found in submerged archaeological sites. Again, underwater yeah. drones are going to be a big game changer. And this coming all the way back, Jason, to your story from earlier, as we continue to search offshore, imagine the kind of things that we'll find. Yeah, I mean, we certainly don't know what else to expect. Uh, structures, encampments, you know, these things, we know they're out there. And as technology progresses, we hope that it gets to a point that we can really focus in on some of these sites. But through um, various means, you know, look, look at everything we've discovered with just LIDAR in the last few years. So, you know, these technological advances are coming. Uh, underwater exploration is only going to get better. And I know right now there's a lot of teams out there in the world of archaeology who are really solely focused on the underwater effort. And I do hope that in the next decade we're going to see some real progression there. Um, we just don't know. We don't know what to expect. You know, everyone said it can't be until there it is, and there's Gobekli Tepe, and everybody's got to rewrite the history book. And, you know, they could dig, dig another site in that same area and, and reset the record again and find something earlier, like you said before. So we just don't know what to expect. Uh, that's the beauty of archaeology is sometimes things just happen that you can't explain, and sometimes uh, you get surprised. You know, you think you have it all figured out, and then you get thrown a curveball. And I love it. I think that's the beauty of archaeology, and that's what keeps it fun. That's what keeps it interesting. I agree wholeheartedly. And, of course, we have so much more to say about Gobekli Tepe. And, therefore, next time we will return to this conversation with our guest, Martin Swetman, who, of course, has also offered some very interesting, even at times controversial perspectives about this enigmatic ancient pre-pottery Neolithic site. I'm equally looking forward to getting into that conversation with Dr. Swetman. And, of course, special thanks again to Sarah Costello, Ph.D., for being our guest on this edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Gentlemen, with that, as is customary, before they shut down, before they turn off the pumps, before they cut out the lights, will you join me at Yonder Bar for one more round here at the Crosstime Pub? Cheers. Make it a Guinness. Indeed, a Guinness is requisite. I see James already has his, so follow us online at sevenages.org. And, of course, you can find us on social media. Just look for Seven Ages Research Associates. On behalf of geologist James Waldo, environmental scientist Jason Pentrail, and yours truly, history lover Micah Hanks, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we'll catch you guys next time here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm -hmm.